So, uh, finally in this lecture I can uh, uh, put a little more meat on the bone and show how you actually use Riemann-Hilbert problems for interesting problems and maybe give you some idea how the steepest ascent method actually works. So, uh, the first problem I want to show is that, first of all, Riemann-Hilbert problems arise in many different ways. Some of them are sy systematic and others sort of uh, come to you from out of the blue. The first one I want to speak about comes from out of the blue and concerns orthogonal polynomials. So you've got some measure, d mu of x, which has finite moments, this is over r. and so on. Then one knows that uh, by Gram-Schmidt you can get applied to 1x, x squared, and so on. You can get a set of polynomials, pi n of x. These are monic polynomials of degree n such that pi n, pi m, d mu, is equal to delta is equal to zero if n is not equal to m. And then uh, one can introduce what are called the normalized polynomials, gamma n times these pi n's. Gamma n's are positive with the property that p n p m d mu is equal to delta n m. Now, uh, orthogonal polynomials are uh, an extraordinarily important and useful part of analysis. So, uh, what we're interested in is, for various reasons, uh, uh, the asymptotics of the orthogonal polynomials as n gets large. And there are special cases special LPs, for example, the Hermit polynomials, Krauchok polynomials, the uh, Legendre polynomials, many, many. And then if you open up Zago's famous book on orthogonal polynomials, you'll find them written out there. And everybody in ra random matrix theory knows about these polynomials because they come up in so many different on on ensembles and in so many different ways. Now, just as we started off these lectures speaking about special functions, and what's special about special functions is that they have integral representations from which you can then infer their asymptotic behavior by using the classical method of steepest ascent. For example, If you look at the Hermit polynomial, Hn of z has this representation. This chalk, chalk isn't good. Hn of z is equal to n factorial times the integral around some circle of w to the minus n minus 1, e to the x, uh, 2x, w minus w squared, dw, and c is any uh, contour around the origin. So if you want to know what's happening, this should be z. If you want to know how the polynomium uh, behaves when n becomes large for any fixed z, you just use steepest descent, classical steepest descent and the form for formula. You open up any book on orthogonal poly polynomial, you'll find their asymptotics, and it's obtained in this way. In fact, for the diligent stu student, one should take a volume like a Abramovitz and Stegen and regard it as an exercise book 
in which you derive all the asymptotics that you see and then using the one tool, which is steepest descent. But this is what you have here. Now these polynomials are orthogonal h n x and not equal to m. And they arise, as we know, in analyzing the, Ga the Gaussian ensemble. And in fact, the first proof of the con computation of the sine, uh, sine kernel, for example, the gap pro pro property was obtained by uh, using the asymptotics of the polynomials. So now people became interested in universality. And the first work on universality was really for unitary ensembles. We, instead of having this weight over here, you had a weight like e to the minus x to the fourth, or a weight like e to the minus v of x, where v of x is some polynomial, x to the 2m, and so on like this. So for ensembles of this kind, you want to prove universality. And this boils down, as we know, to a question about the asymptotics of the polynomials which are orthogonal with respect to such weights. Now, for such weights, there is no known integral representation. So the question is, how are you going to obtain the asymptotic information that you need to prove universality in ra random matrix theory? Now comes what I still regard as an absolutely remarkable fact. And that is, although there is no known integral representation, there is a representation in terms of a Riemann-Hilbert problem. So let's look at weights, which are absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue measure, and consider the following Riemann-Hilbert problem. The contour sigma is just going to be the real line oriented from minus infinity to plus infinity. And the jump matrix V is just going to be a two by two matrix looking like this, where that is that function. And the Riemann-Hilbert problem one wants to solve is you seek Y of Z, which will depend on this, on a parameter N, and that is two by two. between one and two. And it is analytic and C take away R and Y plus of N equals Y minus of N times this V. And the way it is normalized is not in the standard fashion. It's not what we call a normalized Riemann Hilbert from the in the standard sense, but it has this property, z to the minus n, 0, 0, z to the n, goes to the identity as z goes to infinity. Now you look at that Riemann-Hilbert problem, and here is the fact. Solution, y n of z, is equal to pi n of z minus 2 pi i gamma n minus 1 squared pi n minus 1 of z Cauchy transform of pi n times w Cauchy transform of minus 2 pi i gamma n minus 1 squared pi n minus 1 times w. That's the solution of that Riemann-Hilbert problem. The key thing you should be focusing on, so pi n is the polynomial, the monic polynomial, orthogonal with, it, with respect to the weight w. This is a polynomial of n, n minus fir first order and gamma n minus one is the normalizing co co coefficient for pi n minus one. So you see immediately from that 
that the 1-1 one, one entry of z is the polynomial you're looking for. So if you solve the Riemann-Hilbert pro pro problem, you have obtained the orthogonal polynomial. Now, just as it stands, you've converted one problem into the other. Have you made progress? You have made progress because the Riemann-Hilbert problem is exactly of the kind for which you can use the steepest ascent method. So the steepest ascent method applies to this, and you can obtain asymptotics for the orthogonal polynomials, which is as precise as you could get out from this in the Hermit case, in fact, even more, more precise, it turns out. And this can be used in as a basis for proving universality, first of all, for uh, unitary ensembles, and then for, uh, this was done by a number of us, and then you can also use it for symplectic and uh, orthogonal ensembles. Also, Shabina did work on this. Um, uh, so that's why you're interested in why you can do it. So the, why, this pro, pro, uh, pro, why this representation exists is just something which comes to you out of the blue. So it's one of the features. It's, uh, uh, you know, when we learn uh, uh, mathematics, we learn simple problems and we get more and more sophisticated, we build, we build up uh, more and more big machinery, which we then hope we can direct against things. What one must never lose si a sight of are two, two things. One is luck, because in the end you're going to have to be lucky. And the other thing, there's absolutely nothing wrong with just being clever. You're allowed to be clever. And this is what these people did. This was, this Riemann Hil Hilburn problem was found by Fokash, Itzen, Kitaev. So I want to, uh, early on I made a remark of the following kind. I said there are many uses of Riemann-Hilbert problems. I've been focusing very much on the asymptotic uh, ap applications, but they're also analytical applications, and they're also algebraic applications. One of the algebraic applications is that how to obtain differential equa equations using the, or, or difference equa equations using the Riemann-Hilbert problem. So let me show you here. In this particular case, the key thing, key fact, V is independent of the parameter N. So whenever you have a Riemann-Hilbert problem which is independent of a parameter, that will give you rise to either a difference or a differential equation in that parameter. This should remind you of Noether's theory in Lagrangian analysis. Whenever you have a Lagrangian which is independent of a parameter, you obtain an integral. It's a similar kind of situation here. So how does this work? Let's look at y n plus 1 multiplied by y n inverse. Let's look at this. Let's call it r of z. So this is the solution of the Riemann-Hilbert problem, normalized like that, with n replaced by n plus 1, and here is with just n. Now you observe that if you look at r plus of z, that's y n plus 1 plus times y n uh, plus inverse. And this is equal to y n plus 1 minus times v. And this is y n minus times v. The v's cancel out, so you're just left with r minus of z. So in other words, r has no jump across the axis. And taking into account that you have no singularities of the kind I mentioned last time, that means that R is an entire function. R of Z is entire. But now you observe that if I put in here Y M plus 1 of Z, and I multiply Z to the minus N, 0, 0, Z, uh, N plus 1, and I put z to the n plus 1 here. 
And I put a Z here and a zero, zero, and a Z inverse here. And I put in a Y in times Z to the minus N, zero, zero, Z to the minus N. And I take the inverse of that. I take the in inverse of that. And I'm going to get the z to the n plus 1 here. I see this, so I've just inserted something for free. But this object here goes to the identity. This object here goes to the identity. So this means that r of z is an entire function which grows linearly as z gets large. So any entire function which grows like a polynomial is equal to a polynomial. So you see that R of z must have the form A of z plus b. But if you just interpret what that means, You see, that means that y n plus 1 equals a of z plus b times y n. You can get a and b explicitly, but the way you understand it, that's a difference equation. And the difference equation is very familiar to you. It's the, if you work it out, it's just nothing more than the familiar three-term recurrence relation for orthogonal polynomials. Here you see using riemann hilbert problems to derive an equation. Now, let me give a different example. Consider this is called the AKNS operator. It arises in the theory of integrable systems, in particular very fam famous uh, for the nonlinear Schro Schrodinger equation, many other systems like that. And it looks like this. It's dx minus i z sigma plus 0 q of x, uh, q bar of x, 0, and it acts on functions phi equals 0. So it's an operator on the line. Q of x is some function on the line decaying at I infinity. Z is a complex variable. And uh, we have that sigma is 1 half of 0, 0 minus 1. This operator is important for the following reason. That is, if you define L to equal 1 over I sigma times dx minus 0 q, q bar 0. This is a self-adjoint operator. And it's the isospectral operator for the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. This is isospectral opera, isospectral operator for NLS. So in other words, if Q, which there here we have just as a function of X, but if we think of it as being a function of X and T, and its evolution as a function of T is according to the NLS equation, then the spectrum of that operator is going to stay fixed. Those give the integrals of motion for, K, for NLS and make it uh, an integrable system. Now, now, it turns out that for such a differential operator, and more generally for ordinary differential operators, you can always canonically associate it with them a Riemann-Hilbert pro pro problem. So how do you get this Riemann-Hilbert problem? We introduce solutions of the equation. You look at, these are called beals koifman solutions. So you find solutions 
there exist solutions of this equation, z belonging to c take away r, with a property that phi, that this c times e to the minus i x z sigma goes to the identity as x goes to infinity. This is for fixed z. And phi to the minus i x z sigma is bounded as x goes to minus infinity. Such a solution exists for every z which is not real and is unique. Now, what we have from this property, we have that phi e to the minus i x z sigma is equal to 1 plus m1 of x over z plus order 1 over z squared as z gets large. It's part of this normalization. I'm just picking up the next term. Now, phi of xz for a fixed z is a solution of this differential equation. So the boundary value as z goes down to the real x will continue being a solution. The same is true if I now take the boundary value from the bottom. I get a different solution. Any two solutions of an equation of this kind must be related by some matrix over here, which is purely a function of z, independent of x. And the fact of the matter is, if you now, instead of we were working over here, we're freezing z and letting x run, now freeze x and let z run. You find the following. Xz is analytic and C take away R and continuous up to the boundary. So therefore, phi times E to the minus I X Z sigma solves the normalized Riemann Hilbert problem given by sigma v. So immediately you get a Riemann Hilbert problem. And this is true for all ordinary differential equations of different kinds. You can work out what v looks like. v will depend on x as a parameter. It'll be a 1 minus r of z squared, r of z minus r bar of z. And again, you have that r infinity is strictly less than 1. So r of z is called a re reflection co coefficient. And there's a bijection from the initial data, or uh, from functions q, to the reflection coefficient associated with q, which is r. So there's a one-to-one -one mapping between q's and r's. You know Q, you know R, of course, I mean in appropriate function spa uh, spaces. You know Q, you know R, you know R, you know Q. R is an encryption of the initial data. In the linear case, R would just be the Fourier transform of the initial data, or of Q. Now, as I said, in an abstract sense, you can show that L is isospectral. In other words, you can show that the spectrum of L remains fixed. Now, to turn that information into something which is analytically useful, you have to have a method. And the method which works is this Riemann-Hilbert problem turns this integrability into a viable tool. And it works in the following way. If we let Q 
be the solution of NLS. Okay, I want to So, uh, plus this would be a minus 2q squared q, where q of x and t equals 0 is some function, just say, let's call it q, q0. But so, q, qt means the solution of this equation at time t. So, for any time t, you've got a function of x. So now you can map QT to the reflection coefficient of QT, which we can call RT. And this turns out to have the following behavior, which is given by e to the minus i t z squared times r at t equals 0. r at t equals 0 would correspond to r at t equals 0 is just fraction curve. So the Riemann-Hilbert problem really is providing the variables which linearize the NLS equation. If you take a logarithm of this variable, you see it's just moving linearly in time. So that gives you a solution procedure for NLS. QT, you start with your initial data r0. You let r act on it. You obtain the reflection coefficient. You multiply by e to the minus i t squared. And then you take r inverse. So there is this very elegant solution procedure for N NLS. It involves two operations. How do you compute the reflection coefficient? Well, that's a direct scattering problem, which you obtain by solving for these equations and then seeing what the jump matrix is. So you've got a jump matrix. You update it by this data. Then you've got to pull it back by solving this Riemann-Hilbert problem with R replaced by R sub t. So everything depends First of all, on efficient computation of r at time t equals 0. That's one thing. That's a direct scattering problem. But the inverse scattering problem is the question of solving this Riemann-Hilbert problem uh, as t evolves. And for that, you need some method. And of course, the method of the nonlinear me method of steep ascent applies in this particular case. But I just I won't be getting into that fully, but what I want to do is just show you again this use of Riemann-Hilbert problems to uh, get differential equations. So here is an interesting sort of stru structural question. I present you with a Riemann-Hilbert problem looking like this. Now I let it evolve in T. There'll be a two t z squared and the appropriate factor down here. And I know that if I can solve this Riemann-Hilbert problem, I will be able to recover what the solution is. In fact, q of xt is just m1 of xt. I think it's 2, 1 times 2i, something like that. Here is my m. So it's this object here is solving the Riemann-Hilbert the Riemann -Hilbert problem. I look at its asymptotes. I pick up the residue term. Now x, I not only have the parameter x, but I have, have the parameter t. And I look at this residue term, and I take the 2 on entry, and that reconstructs q for, for, for me. Now. This is the thing. Where in this complex variable problem is the fact hidden that I really have a PDE there? How is that piece of information, the differential equation, encoded into the Riemann-Hilbert problem? 
and it comes about in exactly the same way we, we, we were speaking about. If you look at phi, e to the minus 2i, z, uh, e to the minus 2i, xz, right? <coughs> Xc. Okay, now I put in plus uh, t over two z squared times sigma. The effect of this over here is to remove this factor here. So in other words, if I call this object here h, then I have that h is x and t are parameters, but as a function of z is analytic, and c take away r, uh, hxt of z from the plus side is equal to hxt of z from the minus time times 1 minus r squared, r minus r bar 1, and H goes to the identity. So H solves the Riemann Hilbert problem. Normalized Riemann Hilbert are looking like that. In other words, all the dependence on the external parameter has been removed from the Riemann Hilbert problem. And the mantra which we spoke about is that if ever your jump matrix is independent on the, uh, of a parameter, that will give rise to a differential equation. How? you'll find that if you differentiate with respect to x, because this doesn't depend on x, then this derivative also solves this jump relation. So if you look at this times h inverse, that will again be an entire function. And you can show that the asymptotics is just of the form az squared plus bz plus c. You can compute all of these which tells you that you've got a differential equation of this form. But there's nothing special here about x. You can do the same thing for t. And then you'll get another relation, which will look like this, dh by dt. We call something else. Let's call it d times h. So we've got dh by dx equals this thing here. You get two difference equations. Now these relations must be con consistent. So if I put d by dt of dh by dx, that should be d by dx dh by dt. And you substitute this in here. And you need a consistency con condition. And the consistency